The city of Varanasi, also known as Banaras or Kashi, is a sacred Hindi city and one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world. It's located on the banks of the river Ganges in India. Ganges is not simply a river to Hindus, but also the Divine Mother, beginning in the Himalayas and flowing through northern India, bringing life and purity to those who bathe in her water. Hindus and travellers flock to Varanasi to witness the Hindi practice of Ganga Aarti. Where there is a river, there is generally a community reliant on and connected to boats, and Varanasi is no different. Travellers typically watch these ceremonies from the shore or from boats, which collect in their hundreds along the Ganges for a prime viewing spot of Aarti. The sound of boat, boat, rings out all day long, intensifying as dusk falls and people collect for Aarti. While the mother Ganges or Madaganga gives life, she is also important to the passing of life. Varanasi is also the site of the burnings or cremations of bodies. These ceremonies cannot be filmed. What you are about to see are glimpses of the arty practices and the gaps of Varanasi, which may bring forth your own ideas about your life. Yeah, now I'm going to ceremony. Yeah, what happened with the ceremony? There is uh, uh, five prints uh, making puja. What's puja? This is called Arti. A what? Arti. Wow, I cut again. <laughs> <laughs> I have the information here. Uh, for the Hindu people, uh, Hindu religion, they make wood fire from here, you know. And uh, the five kind of body we are not burning. Five kind of body we are not burning. Uh, pregnant women, less than ten year children, snake bite, holy men, sadhu, and Brahman. We are not burning from them. Okay. This this body, this kind of body, we are not burning. We take it for this this body and uh, front of the burning ghat, middle of the Ganga, and we put the in the Ganga. And uh, one body is like a snake bite body. If you are fire, the air is going poison. So that why we are not burning from them. That body, the snake bite body, and just look, man, snake bite body. And we have banana tree. Yeah, but yeah. For Barase. Banana tree and just rough, just flowing in Ganga. Because banana tree is very important. This we call it Ganesha. So if you are married, if you are uh, make any kind of puja, we have banana tree. You use the banana tree. Then that by you know that 90 percent of people are die. 10 percent they get new life. You know 25 years before that the body happens. Uh, one body they throw in nearby bridge. After five hours they get new life. The ceremony is led by priests and involves various rituals involving light and fire, feathers, textures, the lighting of incense, the blowing of a conch shell, hand gestures, body postures, and clockwise movements toward each direction of the compass, the presentation of a big and heavy brass lamp, the chanting of mantras, and the beating of drums and bells. The priests finish the ceremony by pouring water into the Ganges. People lit oil dyers or candles, releasing the flower-filled leaf boats into the Madaganga. You are dead. The story of your death is irrelevant, but you should know that you did not suffer. If this news causes you distress, you shouldn't worry. It was as if you simply left your body behind and now find yourself returned to a spiritual being. The moment of death releases us from the physical world, but for a few minutes, you still carry with you the knowledge of your human experience. You can access memories that float in the matter of your brain. You cannot act on these memories, but for a few minutes, you will be acutely aware of their presence. Here, you can share your life's memorable moments, moments that defined you, or changed you, or simply mattered to you. Maybe you'll see a flashback of memories 
and simply by speaking about them you will add them to the river, to our reservoir of human knowledge, to the global consciousness of this environment. If you made mistakes in your life, and we all do, now is the time to make amends. Now is the time to set your intentions for your next life, if you choose to re-enter the physical world. We hope you enjoy a peaceful journey. Namaste. The truth is, I pick poetry in nature every day, and in people too, even if they come with sunshine and storms. This is my very definition of beauty. Beauty is not to be looked at, but to be weathered, as the landscape knows too well. It isn't beautiful, but made beautiful by the forces of nature. The same with people. Throw as much at me as you can, and I will grow more beautiful. But a monotony of clear blue skies would soon do me in. I would wilt from boredom, grow languid, and begin to hate the very sky that enabled me to see. Gurry is the largest sand island in the world and a place of exceptional beauty. It is called Fraser Island by the Australian government and sits on the east coast of Australia, just north of Brisbane and south of the Great Barrier Reef. It is a World Heritage listed site. That means the island is now protected. It cannot be mined or its forests milled for timber. Tourism also needs to be very carefully managed. The island's national park reverted to its traditional Aboriginal name in 2017. However, the indigenous tribes who claimed native title to the island, the Butchula people, are campaigning to rename the whole island Gurry. Gurry means paradise, and this comes from a Dreamtime creation story. Indigenous tribes from all over southeast Queensland used to visit Gurry before white invasion. We know they came from as far away as Bunya, which is hundreds of kilometres to the southwest, because the trail of Bunya trees grows marking the route, evidence of long ago dropped Bunya nuts. Gurry is famous for its strikingly coloured sand cliffs and over 100 freshwater lakes, some tea coloured and others clear and blue and all ringed by pristine white sandy beaches. Gurry is also the only place in the world where tall rainforests are found growing on sand dunes. The island marks the evolutionary ecological change that can be tracked back to the Ice Age, when Australia split from Antarctica. About 700 million years ago, Antarctica had mountain ranges that rival the modern-day Himalayas, but these became eroded and the mainland of Australia shifted north. Volcanic activity along the continental shelf allowed sand to be deposited over what was once low hilly terrain. Below these world famous and ever shifting sand dunes is an aquifer that holds a table of fresh water bigger than Sydney Harbour. Eli Creek is one of the island's favourite destinations by international tourists and backpackers who come here to see the island's outstanding beauty. Because these environments are so delicate, should people be allowed to visit them? And if so, how many should visit? And how do we decide who gets to visit? Should we increase the cost so the island isn't inundated with visitors who will damage the ecosystem? Or is that unfair to people who can't afford it? The same discussion happens in India. The government wanted to renovate Jaipur's Lake Palace using foreign investment and turn it into a hotel, but locals didn't want it being accessible only to rich people. And so it remains untouched. 
So even though these environments are thousands of kilometres away from each other, both must be managed. The question is, who gets to decide? The Indigenous people, the government, the businesses who want to make money, the tourists who want to visit, or the people who now live there? Personal bathtub. <laughs> 